It is October the 26th, 2024. I'm Chris, and this is the future of photography. The future of photography. And we're back. Adrian, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. It's good to see you. You've been on vacation. I have. I went to Menorca. Um, not a photography-based uh, trip at all. I was off with some friends to play paddle uh, and oh. to enjoy some, some great food and wine and things like that and sunshine, which we don't have any of here in the UK at the moment, but they have plenty still in Menorca. <laughs> okay, um, so that would, that would have been my first question. Any did you do any photography? Um, did so you... a little bit. Okay, so yes, it like wasn't actual photography, photography or or can we count smartphone photography as photography? Uh, so uh, a few uh, hopefully artistically informed snapshots on my, on my phone. Um, but actually, the the thing I did do though is I used my little Insta three sixty Go three S. I think that's the whole name of the camera. Little action. Oh, that's the cam. tiny, the tiny white one. The the. Yeah, I have the black one, actually. They do them in black and white. Um, but uh, it was great. So I used that to video the uh, the paddle drills we we're doing, all the exercises that the coach had us doing. Hmm. Uh, and I, so I could share those with my friends. So, you know, so it's because you, when you take the little tiny camera, it's magnetic. Wow. You can just um, attach it to one of the fence poles on the edge of the paddle court. Uh, and it's just there and out of the way. And you just let it run. And uh, we could all see just how badly we were playing and how how very different our shots were from what the coach was telling us we should be doing. <laughs> so, so, so was that, that was good. Was that just like in preparation for a tournament or something, or just for fun? Just for fun, there were, just for fun. There was twelve. But of us serious went out enough, there. so you recorded yourself to humiliate you afterwards. Yeah, well, it's just a bit of fun, isn't it? It's you know, we we all went out there. It was it was a it was a fun trip, but we were we are cool. all a bunch of people that really are trying to learn and, and be better at playing and stuff like that so the the sporting element of it it uh was was uh was was taken reasonably seriously okay okay well we missed you anyway so um, well it's good to be back good to have you back ah <sighs> so and you prepped a whole show you prepped a whole show in my absence as well which was well, kind I, of I, I i prepped the show for last week but um but jeremiah dropped this little thing in the chat before it's like i got a new printer so of course we had to talk about a new toy and that was a good one it was a good episode very good episode on on getting getting um getting to know a new piece of equipment because printers are like every printer is a different one and if you want to be really deep in the weeds then you have to spend a week with that thing and test and test and test more yeah yeah absolutely uh, so yeah it's good good fun though yeah, but the episode I, I had prepared, I want to talk about today because <clears throat> I'm preparing a new workshop. I've, I'm, I'm preparing like a, a whole bunch of workshops for next year, which will be here in Germany, mostly in German. So sorry, everyone else. But um, <laughs> it, um, and, and I already had all the different pieces of that workshop in other workshops and in other discussions and in other teaching but not okay. in not not in this in this condensed form in this uh in this yeah where everything kind of comes together and uh still looking for a good name and in German we're probably call, calling it Seewerkstatt which translates to seeing workshop or seeing lab or something like that and it's 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 another another try to kind of bring the whole photography thing and we're not talking tech tech photography we're talking the the part that is hard to quant to to quantify to <laughs> um, to measure the the seeing part the understanding part the taking a good picture part which doesn't mean a sharp picture or a, 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 a a, a, a super dynamic range picture or a, a picture with perfect colors or something. That's not what this is about. So, so looking at our show notes, uh, <laughs> you've basically chosen to build a workshop around all the hardest things. <laughs> I, okay. So the thing, the thing is um, I have cracked parts of this for myself over the years and they're not really hard. 
that that's the interesting thing. They uh-huh. might be hard if 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 you haven't really delved into this too deeply. Um, and it it comes down to really basic things like physiology. How does um, how does perception work? How do we see what happens in the eyes? Um, what is the second part behind that? And there's the cognition, like. What do you understand of what you see, and how does the physiology Im- inform the cognition, and so on? Which is tough in German because we have the same word for both. So we oh, like perception <laughs> and cognition in German is Wahrnehmung, and it means the one, but also the other thing, which makes it really weird. Because right, yeah. okay, okay, that's that. Yes, gosh, uh, I suppose I hadn't really given any thought to how the language might make it a challenge. That oh. Totally. <laughs> I, so, I always think of German as being quite a, a sensible, well-structured language. Um, yeah, I would have. Th- it, it's uh, it mostly thought- is, and and you can qualify things, of course. Like you have to just use yeah. a few more words around it. Um, English but, ones, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> English ones for sure. Um, also, like more scientific ones. Right. Okay. German is, yeah, yeah. is more of a descriptive language, so. Um, I don't know. Your your. I always use that that glove example. A glove. It's pretty obvious what it is. And Germans are much more descriptive. It's a ha- handschuh. A handschuh. Handschuh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But then. Yeah. But then you you use a mitten, which again is very obvious what it is. In Germany, that's a fist handschuh. Okay, I didn't know mitten. Right. I knew the first one. I didn't know the second so one. That's that's interesting. Y- you just tack on a few words, and it, it'll make a different yes. kind of sense. Yes. So, so do you go into? I mean, this is just one of like ten topics you've got here. But do you go into some of the? Oh, and the we don't science? have to go over all of them, right? No, no. Do, do do you go into this sort of thing? Do do you bring some science to it about actually how? Yeah, you know, what is the difference between your eye as a sensor and the brain as the as the interpretation engine, and and what actually do we see? You know, and you know the fact that you know due to the construction of our eyes, you actually only see in high resolution and color in the center of your field of vision and towards the edge. It's actually different, but your brain makes and up the difference differences and all that sort of stuff is it that, that kind, kind of thing? stuff that that kind wow. of stuff at, at okay. least at least we'll we'll brush on that because it will cool. help understand a few more things like like you do you only have a megapixel of resolution in your eyes pretty much is that right okay it's, it's like the the the, the cornea the, the the sharp part of the mm-hmm. vision doesn't have that much resolution we, we we create a lot of that in our brains so interesting Interesting. Anyway. Have, for, for the sake of our listeners and viewers, and and for your workshop participants, is there a is there an exercise that we can do to understand like yeah uh, you know, what we actually see and what we don't? Am I am I to sort of sort of stare straight forward and try and sense how sharp or blurry or or colourful the edge of my vision is? Is that that sort of thing? Um, there 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 are plenty of exercises to to figure that out, including things like um, like the colour yellow that is not visible outside your your center of the vision but if you hold a banana mm. outside of your vision you will still see yellow but that is not really there it's because my brain, brain knows it's because it knows yeah, what yeah. a banana is supposed to look like or the whole, the whole white balance thing um we see white even though if you measure it it's yellow and of course that has to do with what is going on on around it and the, remember the dress oh yes i remember <laughs> the dress <laughs> so I can't so, remember which color sets I saw on the dress, whether I saw the one or the other, but I remember the dress. <laughs> and and there, and there's not a there's not an obvious solution that's uh, that's correct. It does, it it works both ways, blue or gold, and um, it all has to do with how you process information. So the whole the whole processing chain is interesting, but then also um, we get deeper into um, attention. Because that's what you want as a photographer. You want to be able to like, like decide where the viewer will or how the viewer will explore the picture, what they perceive uh-huh. as important, what they don't perceive as important, and there are physio- physiological things that inform that, but also psychological things that perform that. Because uh, okay. I, I show you a picture of um, I don't know, let's say a beautiful beach in Menorca. <laughs> That will ring very differently for you than it will for me because you were just there, um, you spent time there, you have uh, a lot of senses involved there that is still fresh. Um, 
I only know it from a picture you sent me, what it looked like there. Yes, so. yes. Yeah. So interesting, yes, and of course, it, it, how how uh, things you pick out as important. I mean, if you have a memory associated with a particular thing, you mm -hmm. know, uh, that, then it's it's going to be different. I remember once years and years ago, uh, there's a um, uh, there's a famous uh, writer of novels about horses uh, in the UK called Dick Francis. He actually used to be a racing jockey many many years ago, but he's written a lot of novels. And I remember it reading one years and years ago, and there was this photograph. It's a murder mystery, and there's a photograph. And uh, it was a photograph of a person and a horse. And uh, one of the twists in the plot, I don't think I'm giving too much away here, is that actually the photograph wasn't a photograph of a person. It was a photograph of a horse and the person just happened to be stood there. And that was, yeah, uh, and it depends on your point of view, right? If you're a horsey person, totally. maybe maybe the photo is the, is, is actually of the horse, right? That, that you knew rather than the person that you knew. So, yes. yeah, yeah, that, that sort of thing would, would change your attention as well, of course. Yes. Oh, definitely. So, so um, I, I call this the, the like your backpack that you carry around with you that is full of conditionings of, of, of junk. Um, yeah. <laughs> memories of junk that that will that will all inform how you look at something and what it does to you. Um, mm -hmm. Goes down to the culture you grew up in. Um, I I've, I've shown like I was in Nepal and hiking and doing uh doing photography and then um i i returned home i developed the pictures i printed out a few really large ones and or like not really large ones but large enough to so i could still carry them back and i brought them back the next year and ah, i okay. gave them to some of our sherpas like pictures of their culture of their um surroundings the place they grew up in and they were like almost like Gave me a shrug. It's, it was it was it was artistically nice photography. It was um, well executed craft, from what I could tell. It was colorful, but they grew up in that culture, in that colorful Buddhist uh, right. inspired yeah, yeah. environment. And for them, there was like, yeah, sure, we see this every day. Yeah. And I showed them some pictures of like a black forest town with wooden frame buildings and uh, a couple cobblestone roads and things and they flipped out <laughs> it's like oh this is so cool this is so amazing where i would be shrugging this off because yeah sure i grew up in that area so yeah one person's exotic is is another person's mundane isn't it it's uh... and it changes how you perceive photography um and that that doesn't just go down to the culture you grew up in it could be the like the village you grew up in with its own bit of subculture or the, your family culture that will probably change the way you look at photography so yeah and in the yeah. end in the end one of the goals is of course to to learn like the importance of um, looking through other people's eyes okay if, if you want to take a photo it the one of the one of the key ingredients is you knowing who that photo is for as in who that photo should click with. Mm. Um, let's let, let's assume you take this photo for an actual reason, not just to be happy to take a photo, but okay. maybe you want to advertise something. Maybe you want to sell something. Maybe you want to um, convey a message or something. And of course, if you know that target audience and you know their culture, that will do something. They, they will yeah. look at that photo in a different way. Um, I've, I remember. <laughs> I remember many years ago. I was in a relationship, and my girlfriend um, had a horse, and she was um, doing some uh, dressage or riding or something, which I'm not super familiar with. And she asked me to take photos of one of the events there. I did, and I thought those were decent photos. I've, I was so convinced that they were, yeah. and then they were all wrong. The the <laughs> horse's neck isn't bent the right way, and the leg is too high, and the angle uh -huh. is doesn't work, and the I don't know, the fur is weird, and like all those details that I have no clue about. Um, yes, because I, I didn't had a, a know very, that culture, you know. 
a, ve- a very much simpler version of that actually uh, I have with my daughter um, where she she loves to have uh, her horse riding lessons videoed because she likes to make TikToks out of them and uh, of course the first few times I went to video it I did what every self-respecting videographer did I shot it in a landscape aspect ratio <laughs> not for TikTok <laughs> and I, I I was swiftly and to be fair to her not too harshly corrected by, but it's a daughter. cultural difference said, it's no, a Dad. different subculture yes <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. yes you need to know that you you do you need to know the audience and the audience well in this case it's it's the channel right, as much as the audience but the audience will be people holding their phones and uh, and the therefore the channel message. is vertically no, oriented yeah 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 there i, I but I, I can i can assure you there are plenty of plugins out there for your run-of-the-mill video editors that will allow you to convert them almost automatically so well f- funnily enough isn't it um you know now things like open gate recording are all the rage with video cameras and as far as i can tell open gate recording just means you form it you, you record everything off the sensor and then you decide your aspect ratio later the irony of yeah. that of course is that the format of the sensor is probably a four by three or something like that which means you're getting actually you know an old tv style you know, uh you know actual native aspect ratio but then you can of course carve stuff out of that if, um, if you've got enough if pixels the, if the medium if, if if the output medium has low enough resolution you can crop it's no problem um this i mean you you know this i've the 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 the, the most of the 360 cameras these days have automatic horizon leveling so you yeah, can... mine does. Yeah, mine has all sorts of options. And right. if you do the equivalent uh, on the in, the Insta360 Go 3S, I think, yeah, I got that right. Um, you actually, the, the, the equivalent on that of shooting um, open gate, I forget what they call it. Um, the sensor in it is a four by three ratio. Um, and you can have it, uh, if you're using the tiny little screen on the back of the unit when you've when you got it docked um, to, to, to uh, set your uh, scene, um, it actually, it will actually show you uh, a cutout of a sixteen by nine and a nine by sixteen. Mm. So it sort of cuts out the four corners of that four by three, so that you can see what's included in each of your potential aspect ratios. But you can change all of that in post because it has gyros in it, so it records metadata about gyros and things like that. Um, so you have various different settings for do you want it to look super wide or do you want it to de-warp it so it looks as straight as possible do you want it to have a horizon lock which it'll do automatically all in the software either on your phone or or a laptop later on Um, it's great because one of of the times last weekend I stuck it up on the pole at the side of the um, at the side of the paddle court and it wasn't quite vertical it was just a little bit skew if and I got it back, and I was looking at it on my on, on my uh, computer, and I was like, "Oh, nuts! It's completely at an angle." And I was like, "Oh, if I just click this little button here, it sorts all of that out for me automatically." It was great. Uh, I just recently um, let's let's just stick with that for a second. I just recently came across well, the system we're using here, Restream, to record the video part, and um, that thing has an extra camera feature, so you can um, add a camera like a smartphone camera for example um oh okay well so, it's a second second camera for each participant sort of thing um here it is here's here's the camera oh look and at that it, i'm looking at at us here um now the interesting thing is that if you you see the phone here and you see the camera yep. and i rotate the phone and the camera doesn't rotate so this auto levels it for ah, the video so i can i can show wow, things okay. without um without it going weird, which is nice because um, if you are in a recording situation and that everything is kind of busy and you are, are not just talking, you're also managing the video and switching things, um, that's one more headache that you don't have to have. So Yeah, no, that's and good. And the video, resolution, the, the video re- resolution we send is small enough so it can just crop from the center and, and straighten it. Yeah, I think this it is one of the things actually. So I guess we, we're massively off track, but but it is it interesting. Matter. It is it is one of the things that has actually finally convinced me to shoot 4K as standard, 
because uh, for, for such a long time, I was like, oh, I'm just going to buy more compute, more disk, more everything. I'll, I'll just stick to, yeah, you because know, I export, yeah, everything I watch is in HD anyway, right? 1920 by 1080. Yeah, that dates so, you. It's 4K these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But do you know what the difference is? If you shoot that open gate 4K, you've got enough pixels to do genuine HD output without any yeah, extrapolation of the pixels because you're just cutting that shape out of the thing. And I know the editing software deals with all this stuff these days because you can just zoom stuff uh, you know, in a... It, whether you're using something consumer oriented like CapCut, which I'm using CapCut a lot these days, or whether you're using something professional like, you know, I know Premiere or whatever, you do just drag and, and zoom, don't you, your video? And and it's, it, yeah, the, the rendering engine in the background seems to sort it all out. To my, yeah, I don't know quite how it does it, but it just seems to make it work somehow. <laughs> well, of course, it always depends on the output you, you need and where you need to like use that. But, but with with social media and with a lot of other use cases that just that's just yeah. fine it's good enough it's it's a virtualization of of the hardware um pretty much as as we see in other well that's an entire new episode um cuz that that's that was a realization recently that the companies are working to take the hardware out not, not physically but that you, you don't have to manage it anymore cuz they do it in a in a good enough fashion. So. Yeah, taking it out out of the equation. Yes, yes. Uh, absolutely. And going, but going back to the whole, you know, actual topic of the podcast, right? You know, dragging us back in that direction. I mean, you know, nobody goes to a gallery and says, "What camera did you film that on?" and and oh. did you do your processing in hardware or software or anything like that? It's, you know, it's you know, it, you know the the topics you've got in your workshop here, you know, uh, mas mastering light concepts, you know, understanding um uh what is aesthetically pleasing light you know uh, you know seeing through others eyes as you mentioned a few few minutes ago none of that is related in any way to either hardware or software really is it <laughs> and and i mean the, the the being able to understand light to use it well to um to use it to your advantage and to the image and the, and the story's advantage that you want to tell is um is another concept that just turns out that that is kind of important and if you are if you're better doing that if you if you if you know what to look for and how to use it that'll make your photography better so yeah that's that's it's kind of that's kind of the the, the ideas behind this event it's not fully 100 percent fleshed out yet but um that's the areas i want to dig in a bit deeper and well i think i think it's fantastic yeah you know, as as a I'd, I'd love to go on a workshop like this sadly my, my german is 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 not uh if, <laughs> non-existent if you, but the, <laughs> if you find enough people i'll do one in english <laughs> Well, yeah, there we go, listeners. There's the call to action, right? Let's there get into is. the Discord, right? If anybody is interested in doing uh, this work, this type of workshop uh, in English, I guess somewhere in Western Europe at some point in 2025 or 2026, um, you know, that, let, let us know in the Discord. It'd be it'd be fantastic to try and organise uh, something like this, a, a time where you can really focus on on the photography itself. Um, so this, this is about learning to see. Do you it, at the and that's that that's very focused at the the capture end of the process, right? I guess, isn't it? And you know, composition and understanding what's going on. Do you um, do you do you follow that through the workflow in in this out, you know, to to an output uh, in this uh, particular sure. format of workshop? Yes, yes, because of course um, some of those concepts include. Things like how do you how do you direct attention? And of course, you can do some of that in post. You can do some of that by a by the right crop of your picture or by by enhancing some of the colors and contrasts and taking down some other areas. You have you have a lot of power in shaping that experience and in shaping the the attention flow that the that the recipient has um, in post processing. So. Um, if you know these concepts, and with the knowledge of these concepts, if you sit in front of any photo editor, um, you'll understand where where you need to take this or where you can take this. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's that's it's it's, so a, it's a real it's skill. A bit, it's a bit more universal. Yeah. It's, it's not like this is how you do it in Lightroom. That's not what it's about. Yeah. It's it's more like the general concept of of uh, attention management and perception management, and and uh, once you know these doesn't really matter what software you use see again i would really benefit from that because i i think i I personally have a better handle on on that of how you how you influence and 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 manipulate the mood for example of a photograph i think i have a better understanding of how to do that when it's actually uh, a video because you can then through sound design and music bed and things like that uh, uh, you know add to your color grade so i remember a couple of years ago we were out walking with some family friends and the kids yeah we were just in this area where there happened to be some some statues planted around this forest and and they were they yeah they're, they're lovely statues and it was a bright sunny day and it was really warm we were having a great time and just because these statues appeared to sort of lurk a little bit i decided to make it a sort of scary movie right the movie that i shot that day so you know i gave it a a, you know a a darker less saturated color grade i used music every time there was a you know yeah suspenseful music music. every time yeah that every time there were one of these videos one of these uh statues sort of was lurking in the background of a clip i'd shot and stuff like that i had no idea that that when i uh when i shot it it all came from the post so so i think i have an idea of you you have quite a lot of levers and pulleys yeah you know, when you're uh, working in film but in photography i think it's a much more subtle thing isn't it well and and you do uh, you do have a lot of things you can do in post but if you if you of course have a vision where you want to take this when you shoot it that will be like the, the perfect storm you have both sides and the one thing works together with the other and and you end up with an even better result so uh mm. fixing things in post yeah it sometimes works i have done it plenty but um the more i i know about where i want to take this um the more i can like think with a, with the future of that thing in mind and uh, mm. even during the shooting and then it becomes a different thing so anyway yeah. that's that's kind of the 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 ideas that i'm that i'm playing with right now and well we'll see We'll uh, hey, uh, we should track this. We should come back and revisit this, right? When you've got a bit more, yeah. You know, when you when you've got it together yeah. more, and you, yeah, you know, and yeah, you know, when you're at eighty percent or ninety percent on so it, and I have two events where I want to want to actually do this kind of a workshop. The first one is a dedicated workshop here in where I live, with like maximum of like ten people um, in March, and then in May we have this this annual abbey workshop that i've been I knew you were going to say that. I knew about. you were going to do I've this been in the raving abbey on workshop. about this and uh we had the the op- we opened the the reservation system a couple of weeks ago ah, and okay. it sold out in 50 minutes so it wasn't too bad awesome. i'm quite happy and uh, and that's a part of this and that's that's the place so in march is going to be a dedicated workshop just about learning to see and that is kind of the test balloon for the okay. abbey workshop so cool sounds great well done and and well done the, for on doing the, abbey the hard workshop, stuff <laughs> on, on the abbey workshop is going to be part of like a whole week of things so um, yeah because you have the luxury of time on that one don't you uh, five six days of yes. nothing but yeah. photography day and night so i'm happy that this uh that this is still going we've, we've been doing this for 15 years <sighs> anyway <laughs> good stuff okay yeah we'll, we'll i'll keep track of this and it will probably morph an update over the next weeks or months but yeah that's the that's the early thoughts about this so shall we do some see? picks 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 um let me bring up yours first you brought us photo some photography <laughs> Here yeah, specific, specifically the Black and White Photo Awards, uh, uh, and the link in the show notes is is actually to the the winning photos from the twenty twenty four competition. Um, I just uh, it, it, it's it, it's an amazing thing. I, I've I've been doing mostly black and white photography now for I don't know, let's say eighteen months, possibly closer to two years, uh, and uh, you know I, I I'm. I'm still feel like I'm only scratching the surface 
of, of what's possible. So to see something like this, a whole collection of, of photos, you know, award-winning black and white photos, it is amazing. Um, it appear they appeal to, uh, I think in some of them they appeal to the set my sense of of, of graphic imagery, um, which, which I like. The the one you're just showing there right now, that's an interesting one. That yeah, the one of Baker Street Tube. So um, and uh, people who know London um, uh, and have travelled regularly on the tube will know that there are some lines that are almost at ground level, and you get these light wells that are dug from from, from ground level. And this is a picture of, of Baker Street Tube Station, which is is one of those. Um, and actually when you go there, they're quite light and airy places. They're, they're, um, quite colorful in, in, in at times as well, but to see it rendered in a very artistic, very contrasty black and white way is, is awesome. It just gives a new dimension to a view that I personally know very well. Right. So gloomy feeling in this picture, right? It, it does a bit, but you know, it, it, it's a joy to go to those stations because, of course, oh, yeah. the reality is you, you go, to, you get to those stations through dark tunnels, right? So, so when you get there, that you, you feel like you're going into an open, well lit space. And it's like, <laughs> so it's an interesting interpretation, but I'm loving it. There's all sorts of great stuff in here, you know. Um, some of it is uh, less contrasty, higher key type stuff, you know. Uh, a lot of it, of course, being in, in is about light. Um, when you shoot in black and white, it gives you a yeah because it's all about the tone. It's all you it? have yeah. in black and it's white. All it's all you it's have. The shapes right. and the, the contrasts, pretty much. Yeah, so uh, it, it's it's a great way, uh, and I thought it, it fit the topic for today <laughs> in my mind because I think you know shooting in black and white is a good discipline for learning to see light and learning to see tone yes. and, and things like that. Uh, totally especially is. effective. I find, which is, I know by old fashioned standards is probably considered a, an unfair advantage, but, but I love seeing it in the viewfinder of my camera. I love seeing the, the, uh, in the EVF, the, well, actually how the picture will, will come out because sometimes you can look at things, you can think, oh, there's really good contrast there. And you put the camera to your eye and you realize actually it's only color contrast. Yeah, and it's not actually a, uh, a a contrast of luminosity, yeah, it, 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 yeah, or, or, or tone. So, um, yeah, it's great to. Uh, it, I, it, I find it uh, really good fun to play uh, with the uh, the black and white viewfinder setting. It's it's black and white. That's that's this wonderful layer of abstraction on your photos. And composing yes. in black and white through your viewfinder is, again, it, it kind of detaches you a little bit of the reality of things and makes them very different and very special. So um, I like it. I like it. Good one. All right. I brought us, okay, um, a, let's say a piece of, a piece of photo history. Um, how do you take a screenshot? Oh, um. Good question. I guess I just type screenshot into my computer and it gives me a little window to take a screenshot or on my phone. It's just a couple of just buttons, isn't press it? Press a couple of buttons, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Back in the mid-80s, a screenshot was taken with a device called a screen shooter, a piece of hardware okay. that uh, you... Um, let me share this. Um, that is a... is a hood that you put on your computer screen... And it has a camera on the other end, or it has brackets for a camera. In this case, the screen shooter system uh, had includes it includes a hood that fits over your monitor, special lenses, a Polaroid one step six hundred camera with bracket and a second bracket that holds a thirty five millimeter SLR <laughs> camera. So that, awesome. that that tube kind of thing uh, just keeps out the the light around it. And it looks like one of you know when you have uh, when you buy like a, a loop for the the screen on the back of your camera, yes, you know, it's pretty much to, the same thing. a magnified. <laughs> it, yeah, it looks looks like one of those, but enormous. And of course, you have to like fit it to the different monitors, and um, but yeah, that that is how a screenshot was taken before you could just press a button and uh, a PNG fell out. This is. Uh, uh, a Polaroid or a DSLR, no, an SLR, <laughs> a film camera taking a picture of a screen. That's wild. Yeah, you take it? A film camera seems a little bit, um, a little bit excessive, given that the screen at the time would either have been green or black. <laughs> yeah. True. 
True. Yeah. Well, thirty-five millimeter SLR, whatever, whatever they used, it's um, yes, it's kind of a wild concept. By the way, it cost cool. only one hundred and sixty-nine dollars. Uh, that, that would have been a fair amount of money in those days, though. I think. Sort of right. right? And it's just for the hood, right? Not for the camera itself. <laughs> I think it comes with the brackets at least, so you can attach a okay. few different cameras there. So. Awesome. Great it's little a piece of history. I've never it's thought about that at all, and I've never seen anything like that. So that's lots of fun. All right. Um, I think that was it for today. This episode of The Future of Photography is in the can. Of course, um, find us at thefuturephotography.com. Join our Discord. You can find our videos on YouTube. We have photos on our website um, that you can look at if we talk about them here in the show. And um, we'll be back probably next week. Yeah, awesome. All right. Until then, Cheers everyone, then. take care and bye-bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Join the discussion on our Discord, find the show notes and all episodes at thefutureofphotography.com and subscribe wherever you listen to audio. 